So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. We'll continue this morning our study of the Olivet Discourse. Let's begin Matthew 24, reading from verse 15 to the end of uh, this section, or actually to verse 31. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is. Do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if, if possible, even the elect. But I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the, in the, in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the sun and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. We spent some time in the text here for the last several weeks, and then before uh, Christmas we spent time here as well. And we've been working through the context of this and seeing that there is what is near future and far future. I keep reminding you of that because I want you to see it properly. And I want you to understand when you're reading these texts, you have to see things that are near future and then see the glimpses of what are far future. Now, I want to give you just an identification of that from the text and a reminder. Last week, we looked carefully and noted that the Lord Jesus is saying Daniel the prophet prophesied the desolation and that to him was something far future because now we're some 500 or years so removed from what Daniel prophesied and the Lord Jesus is now speaking about that desolation. And when he speaks about that desolation, he uses very important words he points to the idea of you must flee. He gives a geographical context to his hearers. Now, think about it. Jesus wasn't preaching to you and I right then and there. You and I weren't alive. It's his disciples who were standing in front of him. They were at the Mount of Olives, and he says to them, you, you need to hear this. And he says to them geographically, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. He's speaking to them very specifically about a region that they understand. Luke gives the context of this and brings up Jerusalem. When the armies surround Jerusalem, when the Gentiles trample Jerusalem underfoot, to the disciples they would have understood that there was some kind of near future context to this that they could see or at least understand because that was something specific that they knew. 
It was to them in the moment, and it was about geographical regions and city that they knew. And he's warning them carefully and thoughtfully. And this is where we start this morning. We talked about the desolation last week, and we were trying to make the case that this desolation that's being spoken of was the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. This would be that period of time, sometime after the ascension of Christ, in A.D. 70, Jerusalem was destroyed. Historians write about it. It's a known time, and it was a very, very dark time, and this is that desolation in near future context. You say, whoa, whoa, Brandon, wait a second now. There's no hope for anything far future here? Oh, yeah, yeah, there he is. Look at verse 27. He's our, and I'm going to get to this, but I want you to, just so I can calm your hearts and minds, there is a far future context because he warns them, and we're going to get to this, about any prophecy about his, his coming. And he says, don't believe them if they say that I'm in the wilderness when this desolation has come. Don't believe them. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. There's some evidence, something far future. There's further evidence in verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, that's a reference to something far future, the second coming of Christ. Now, why would I say that in the text here? I'm not even getting into Revelation. We've already, I preached through Daniel some months ago. I'm not even getting into Revelation. Why would I say that from this text? All right, let, let's compare and contrast here. Verse 30 says, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Something happens in far future time where all the tribes of the earth will mourn. But in the earlier context of this desolation that Daniel prophesied, Jesus doesn't say all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn about that desolation. Well, all the tribes of the earth didn't mourn when Jerusalem was destroyed because a lot of people were tired of dealing with the Jews. But there's a coming day where it won't be like that desolation of A.D. 70. There's a coming day when Christ returns and every tribe will mourn. Whatever is going to happen in His second coming, nobody will miss it. It will be unmistakable and nobody will miss it. So there's near future, the desolation, the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, and then there's far future, the second coming of Christ. Now let's look at that in a little more detail. Number one this morning, and I have one main point, and I have subpoints to follow that. So you ought to be excited. Number one, the desolation, speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem, the desolation was revealed with warnings for the disciples. The desolation was revealed with warnings for the disciples. Matthew Henry and Thomas Scott both give this context. The prophecy first respects events near at hand, the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the Jewish church and state, the calling of the Gentiles, and the setting up of Christ's kingdom in the world. Now that's a lot of what we dealt with in the first two messages. We're in part three now, okay, of this section. The setting up of Christ's kingdom of the world. But it also looks to the general judgment, they say. And that's something we just talked about, verse 27 and verse 30 and 31. Toward the close, points more particularly to the latter. When we close out this section, it points more particularly to the latter, the general judgment, the second coming of Christ. So we have this desolation of Jerusalem that is revealed in the near future and these have warnings for the disciples. 
what kind of warnings are there? Now, some of the warnings I'm going to go through quickly because we've already discussed some of them. Letter A, do not return to the city for protection. There's a warning here for the disciples. Do not return to the city for protection. Verse 16, flee to the mountains. Verse 17, flee from your house. Don't go to the city for protection. You're not going to get it there. That's what's going to be destroyed. That's what Rome did. They marched in and they surrounded the city. They had already destroyed places all in the region of Judea. And then they come in and they surround the city and they destroy Jerusalem. Literally destroy it. So he says, flee to the mountains. Don't flee to the city. He says, flee from your house. Don't go back to get your coat. Don't go, don't go downstairs and get anything. You just flee. Go. So he says, do not return to the city for protection. What's another warning? Letter B. Do not waste time to flee for protection. Do not waste time to flee for protection. Verse 17. Leave your goods behind. He's telling them right then and there. When you see these armies surrounding Jerusalem, according to Luke chapter 21, verses 20 to uh, 20 whatever it is, I forget right now. When you see the, the army surrounding Jerusalem, don't waste time to go get your coat. Leave your goods behind. Verse 18, leave immediately without delay. Verse 18, whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Don't turn back to go get anything. If you're out in the field and you see these armies surrounding, if you hear them coming, go, he says. So don't waste time to flee for protection. Letter C, do not rely on yourselves for protection. Do not rely on yourselves for protection. Why? Well, in verse 19, he gives an indication. Providence at some future point will be very difficult. Providence at some future point will be very difficult. Verse 19, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. This is going to be a difficult providence when this happens. It's not going to be easy to flee and get away. The pregnant mother, the nursing mother. It's going to be a hard time. Now, you know, we, we live in a day and age where it's a little easier to travel, especially than it was then. Okay? But it's hard enough when you got a couple of ch small children... Uh, and, you, you know, mom's pregnant and you got one or two small children and you're having to deal with traveling somewhere six, seven, eight hours. I've done that. When our kids were small, you, you pack a car full of everything you can imagine. You can't see out the rearview mirror. You got all these kids in their seats. Mom's pregnant and she's going to sit for several hours. The baby's on her bladder. You thought it was going to be a six-hour trip, and it turned into ten. There's spit up everywhere. There's all kind of stuff happening. You're pulling over, changing diapers, all those kinds of things. Well, they didn't have cars then. They didn't have all that. He's saying, you got to flee. And it's going to be really hard for some people. Because this providence is going to be a difficult providence. The destruction of Jerusalem would be a cataclysmic providence with great difficulty. It's a reminder for all of us, we will endure difficult providences. In the meaning of the text, he's dealing with what is to come with the destruction of Jerusalem, warning them and cautioning them. But it's a reminder for all of us in application, every single one of us is going to have difficult providences in our life. And we can't rely on ourselves for protection. Well, what hope is given? The hope is given in verse 20. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. Pray for God's mercy in your flight is what he says. In your fleeing, pray for God's mercy. need to recognize a few things here. The hope that is given is prayer. Prayer is a required activity for a believer. 
Every one of us is going to have difficult providences. He's saying to them, this is going to be cataclysmic. Everything you know is going to be destroyed. Everything you can fathom in all of your world is going to be destroyed. Don't rely on yourselves. Rely on God and pray unto him. Cast yourself before him. And for a believer, this is a required activity. There's not one believer who can say, you know what? I'm not the kind of Christian that needs to pray. I'm another kind of Christian. No. Scripture says, pray without ceasing. Pray in joyfulness. Pray in rejoicing and thanksgiving. Pray earnestly. Pray honestly as the psalmist teaches us to pray. Pray in the context of how the Lord taught his disciples to pray. Pray in the context of the sovereignty of God. In his holiness. Pray to deal with our sin. You know what? If you're a Christian that says you don't need to pray, then you don't understand confession of sin and repentance. Every one of us needs to pray. And one of the ways that we deal with difficult providences is that we are living in an understanding of being a praying people. We're praying before the providence happens because we're prayerful-minded people. We're praying when the providence happens and we're praying after the providence happens. He says to him, this is going to be cataclysmic. Pray for God's mercy in your flight. It's a reminder to us the importance of prayer in everyday activity. Do you just simply go about your day thinking not of what James told us? Well, I, I, I'm going to do this and I'm going to go there and I'm going to have this. James says, no, if the Lord wills is what you should say. We shouldn't take these things for granted. And even in a text like this where the meaning of the text is specifically dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem, there's application for us. Do not rely on yourselves for protection. Now that doesn't mean that there's not ways that we protect ourselves. Um, you know, all my... Second Amendment people in the room and self-defense and all this kind of... Okay, fine, fair enough. You all know who I am, most of you. Certainly, we, we're thoughtful about defending ourselves. But there might be a situation where you can do all you want to, but the wisest thing is to pray for your flight. All those who fled to the city in AD 70, what did I tell you last week happened to them? They were completely annihilated. It was one of the better parts of Jewish history where they had some of the better weaponry that Jewish armies had had. They had some of the best weaponry they had had in all of the time of Jewish history. They weren't just the ragtag bands of the day of David. These were some of the better armies of the Jewish background and they were annihilated. You may have to defend yourself one day, and rightly so. Be prepared to do so if that's necessary. And yet at the same time, be reminded that ultimately, there may come a time you need to pray for your flight. Prayer in everyday activity is required for a believer. Letter D. Another warning. Do not believe false teachings for protection. Do not believe false teachings for protection. We recognized last week that in verses 21 and 22, Jesus is speaking about this great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now. And remember, now he's speaking to these Jews. Jesus doesn't have this huge Gentile ministry like Paul does. Jesus is speaking to these Jewish disciples. And he's saying to them, there's going to be something that happens that's a great tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Well, for them, they could not imagine the destruction of Jerusalem. Zion, the city of God, where the temple is, that would have been just ridiculous to them. No way. And we even have this 
this addition made to our temple by Herod. The, the stones are so thick, it's amazing. What is going to happen? What could happen to this place? But he's warning them it will happen. And it's going to be a great trip. That's the tribulation that he's speaking of, is AD 70. And then he says in verse 22, unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And we took some time to look at this last week, and I, I won't belabor the point, but you need to recognize this is the mercy of God saying that for the sake of the elect, this great tribulation of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, it's going to be cut short. This is not going to be ongoing forever and forever and ever. The judgment of God on the Jewish people here will be cut short for a time. It will be used for a time and then it will be cut short. That's another reason there's a distinction here because when Christ come, comes in his second coming, he's going to rescue all of his people and there won't be any time left or anything cut short. All those who die in Christ will be rescued. All those who are not in Christ, they will endure eternal wrath. That's not going to be cut short then. We said last week there was a mercy there. God dealing with his elect brought a mercy to all of the people around that the Jews in and of themselves, they got a respite. They got a rest from Rome pressure. But when Christ returns, his second coming, there won't be any respite. The only rescue will be for those who are in Christ. The others will endure eternal wrath. Well, after he mentions this time, this tribulation, having a time frame, it's going to be cut short. It, it won't last forever. Notice in verse 23 the word then. Then. Speaking of the aftermath of this tribulation, the time of and the aftermath of this tribulation, the destruction of Jerusalem, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false prophets and false uh, Christ will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the let. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the rooms, in the inner rooms, do not believe them. He says, do not believe false teachings for protection. Firstly, in her letter D, Christ warned, warned them false prophets would arise in that time. Now this is interesting because there's, in the near future, leading up to the time of A.D. 70, probably between A.D. 60 and A.D. 70, Scripture's already noting that there's, these false prophets are there. In 2 Corinthians 11, 4, 4 through 13, Paul notes false prophets in Corinth who were preaching, quote, another Jesus, different from the Jesus of the apostles preaching. It was already happening leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Can you imagine when the destruction of Jerusalem comes, how all these false prophets come out of the woodwork immediately and start to try to say, well, here's the Christ and there's the Christ. Why would they do such a thing? Some people are going to be pointing to that because everything's been destroyed. They're looking for some piece of hope in the moment. It's what we do in times of great despair. We've used the illustration before. Just like September 2001, 9-11. It happened, and man, all of a sudden, for the next six months, churches are full. They're looking for anything. They go to all kinds of churches. Give us some kind of hope. The same would be true in that day. And we see elements of it already happening. Even Peter warns of it. He's taking his lead from the Lord Jesus, 2 Peter 2.1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly, secretly come in among you. 
They will introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. They will bring swift destruction upon themselves. When we consider this context, we need to note the Lord Jesus told them in advance this was going to happen. It was happening leading up to that time and would happen in the aftermath of that destruction of Jerusalem. And he says to them, So if you were told, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. He had warned them in advance of the desolation that this tribulation was coming, and he warned them in advance of the false prophets in the aftermath of the desolation. But thirdly, under this letter, Christ warned them not to look for him according to the false prophecy. That's interesting because the Lord Jesus is pointedly saying to them, hey, don't don't look for me because I won't be there. If you say, if you hear them say I'm in the wilderness, don't go because I won't be in the wilderness. If you hear them say I'm in some inner room, don't go because I will not be there. It's the context that he gives here to remind us. Then in verse 27, he says, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. When storms start rolling in, everybody sees it and knows it. Maybe you've seen these pictures of the Midwest they call Tornado Alley. Even in our region, we have what's called Dixie Alley, the Tornado Alley of the Deep South that runs from Alabama into Georgia. When those storms start rolling in, and it's during the daylight, everybody sees them coming. He says, this is going to be really cataclysmic and bad but it will not be like my second coming. So if they tell you I'm here, don't believe them. Because at this destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, that is not my return. He brings us to this fourth warning. Christ warned them the tribulation of Jerusalem in 70 AD was not his final judgment. Christ warned them the tribulation of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. was not his final judgment. This is an important text here, and it feeds to other important texts in the Scripture because this text tells us plainly that Jesus said at the desolation or the tribulation, the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, that was not his Return, nor was it his final judgment. It was a judgment on the nation of Israel, but it was not his second coming, and it was not his final judgment. This is important because in the history of Christianity, there have been those who said Christ already returned at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. They have taught that Christ himself already came again. And this text, I think, along with many others, in agreement with me, that that is not the case. Actually, this is a direct denial of any such teaching. That teaching is called preterism. Um, you may not know that term, and that's okay. Um, but it's out there. It's not as prevalent now as, as it has been in times past, but there have been quite a few debates about it in some recent uh, Christian contexts. And this text is in direct denial against preterism. You say, well, what is preterism? Well, one writer says, full preterism teaches that all biblical prophecy has been fulfilled, including the second coming of Christ. 
Satan and the Antichrist being thrown in the lake of fire, the resurrection of the dead, and the full arrival of the kingdom of God. That's what preterism teaches. And you need to note that one of its main points is, is that the second coming of Christ has already occurred. Well, I think this text is saying no, because the text is teaching us, I think, plainly here about the destruction of Jerusalem and about that desolation in A.D. 70, and Christ, in point of that, pointedly says, when that desolation happens, don't believe the false prophets who tell you I'm over here in the wilderness or I'm in these inner rooms because I won't be there. He's saying that's not my second coming. It is a judgment, but it's not the final judgment. Jesus shuts down any thought that his second and final coming is at the desolation or destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. His second coming will be unmistakable. And that's why he says in verse 27, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. He says it's going to be so unmistakable, my second coming, It'll be like scavengers gathered around a dead body. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Uh, when you see that dead deer on the side of the road and all those vultures gathered by it, it's pretty unmistakable what's happened, right? Do you see vultures landing on the backs of deer walking in the field? Do you see vultures riding on the backs of cows, hopping a ride with an armadillo? Is that what you see? No, you see the vultures gathered when the body's dead. And it's unmistakable. You know when that vulture is there and they're all gathered around and you see that dead animal, what do you say? It happened. The animal's dead. The second coming of Christ will be that unmistakable. There'll just be no mistaking it. Whatever details we're looking for to try to figure out the second coming of Christ, Jesus says, you know what? You won't know the time or the hour, but when it happens, it'll be that unmistakable. It'll be like the vultures gathered around a dead body. It'll happen like the lightning flash in a storm. It'll come upon you so quick, it'll be recognizable, and it'll be just like the vultures gathered around the dead body. Now, how many of your versions, instead of the word vulture, have the word eagle in it? Anybody? Okay, good. I'm glad. You know, there's a lot of debate about that translation of that word uh, for eagle uh, or vulture. Uh, and there's been a lot of ink spilt over the fact that it couldn't be the word eagle because eagles are not really scavengers in the sense that a vulture is. Uh, I would beg to differ. Um, I, it doesn't matter to me whether your version says vulture or, or, or eagle. Both are birds of prey and scavengers. Now, you, we don't get to see eagles that often. But if you want to go online, you can research and you can find eagles will gather in large numbers around dead stuff. They do not care whether they swoop down on it, kill it and eat it themselves, or whether they already find it dead. Matter of fact, there's pictures of, and video of places in Alaska where the big fishing boats come in and a lot of the, the discard, the guts of the fish, uh, all the... Thousands of fish are being put out. The eagles are gathered in droves to eat the, the leftover entrails. They're just on the docks. They're everywhere. There's even places in Alaska where you can find pictures and videos that eagles are gathered around dumpsters. They're at dump sites. They're eating whatever they can. I know they're our nation's majestic bird. I'm not trying to ruin that for you. Fly, eagle, fly. But I'm not wanting you to be worried about the text here. Whether it says eagle or vulture, it's the idea of this scavenging bird of prey gathers around the dead body. And that's how unmistakable 
the return of Christ is. Christ gives an important picture here. Just a glimpse of his far future second coming. Now why does he do that right in this section? Before he even gets to some of these other words. Because he has told them about how awful this desolation will be. Now remember, he's speaking to his disciples. His disciples are, are, are predominantly, these are, these are believers. They're listening to him. They're following him. They follow him. They have followed him all the way up to this point that this is the last week of his life here on this earth. Before his death and burial and resurrection and ascension. And they followed him all the way to this point, and now he's going to tell them. Remember the first part of chapter 24? Look at all these stones and buildings. There won't be one left standing is what he says in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 24. Disciples, you're looking at all the wrong stuff. I'm telling you right now there won't be one thing left standing. He's already told them. In three days I'll tear this down and build it up again. And he's given them now a picture of how awful the desolation will be when the temple is destroyed. When Jerusalem is destroyed in A.D. 70, he's giving them a picture. It's a picture of great warning. Don't waste time. Flee to the mountains. Don't go to the city. Don't go back and get anything. Pray for God's mercy to you at the timing of what may happen. Pray that God make this not in the winter or on the Sabbath. It'll make it hard. Those who are going to be pregnant or nursing children, it is going to be a difficult time. Pray, 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 pray. It's going to be so awful that people are going to go around saying false things about my return and I won't be there, so don't look for me then. I will not be there in person. I'm leaving my spirit with you because I promised him, but I will not be there in person. He's saying, don't look for me. But here in this one little glimpse, he says, here's the hope. I am coming again. And don't you fret about it. And when I come, it will be unmistakable. It will be unmistakable. The Lord Jesus furthers this in verse 29. He says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I think here this is a transition. He's still speaking of the tribulation of the present or excuse me, of the near future present coming to them. But he's transitioning into what he will speak about in verses 30 and 31 about his second coming. Because he says, but immediately after the tribulation, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Now, once again, this is apocalyptic language. He's not speaking of literally in the context that somehow the sun is going to be completely darkened and it's not going to work as it's supposed to. He's talking about the desolation itself. That's going to be a very, very dark time. It will seem as though everything about life has changed. If you can just imagine for a moment, once again, as I pointed last week, can you imagine the whole of the city of Atlanta being completely destroyed and trampled to the ground? Just a city of complete rubble. Now you remember... Two towers fell, and do you remember the amount of smoke from those fires and that rubble? Do you remember looking at the plumes? That was two towers. Can you imagine a whole city? The amount of smoke and rubble in the air. Just the dust covering what was the sunlight. You may have witnessed yourselves in person or seen something on TV of these great forest fires and how the smoke is so great it almost 
it almost just dims the sunlight. He's giving them this picture that after that tribulation of those days, it will be as the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. It's like everything is just over. Like the stars will fall from the sky. It will shake you so badly because everything you know will be completely destroyed. He's warning them. In this fifth warning, Christ warned them of dark days following the destruction of Jerusalem. They are going to live in some dark times after that destruction. And to live in those dark times after that destruction, they needed that little bit of hope they just heard. And they need a little bit more. And Christ continues to give it to them. Don't you and I need hope? Don't we look around us sometimes and it just looks like it's hopeless? I don't know about you, but there's just times I, I just read things, whether it's news or whatever it may be, and I just think, how many more liars can there be in one town than Washington, D.C.? How many more lies can be perpetuated to a whole nation and country? Are they holding any of those people accountable? I'm sure even this week you're aware of some of the lies that have been uncovered in our own nation's government about the last few years. Who will they hold accountable? How many relationships were destroyed over the last three to four years because of differences of opinion about what took place? And some of those differences were pe perpetuated by lies. Good people. How many more lies can come out of the mouths of these people? How much more money can they take from businesses and people and cities and use it on garbage? Some of it just horrifically sinful, terrible garbage. Some of it just ridiculous garbage. We don't care about the drain plug in a bathtub and what it does or doesn't do. I don't need a search and a study that's worth $10 million for that. You put the plug in when you want the water in the bathtub, you take it out when you don't. Folks, there is nonsense and ridiculousness that goes on and it's all a bunch of garbage and lies and what hope is there for us? I think Jesus is saying there's hope in the truth of the gospel. That's for first and foremost what he's saying. There's hope in the truth of the gospel because in the gospel he's saying, I came. I'm here and in three days I'm going to tear this thing down and raise it up. And he's saying, and I'm coming again. But I'm coming again at the timing of of the Father. Not at the timing of the false prophets. And you and I have to remember he's coming again and it's on timing. Now I'm going to unfold. I, 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 there's no way for me to get into other things I want to unfold this morning. I'm going to unfold some of these dark days a little bit more clearly. Lord willing, I'll do that next week. But I want you to remember there's hope even when you see all that garbage out even when a guy can murder somebody and not be convicted properly. We have, we're, we're paying for people sitting in jail who murdered people and they ought to be put to death. But you and I, taxpayers, we're paying for that garbage. What hope is there? There's hope in the gospel. Possibly, maybe one of those murderers is, in, is the elect and God's going to bring about their salvation before he brings them home. Not all of them. I, I, I wish it could be, but not all of them. See, there's hope in the gospel. The person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give glory to him this morning, even as we come to the table. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, be merciful to us as we come to your table. That there would be a real, a real understanding of who you are and what you've done for sinners. We praise you for what you did on this earth and what you are doing now as you intercede on behalf of your people. And we praise you for what you will do when you come again. You will set all things straight. All things will be reconciled. And we praise you for that. Be with us now as we come to the table to be thoughtful about our own sin, that we would be repenting repenters. We pray and ask your mercy upon us according to your grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone. It's in his name we pray.